We first reported on breast ironing back in 2016. It's where hot objects are used to press and destroy the breasts of girls as young as nine. It's a practice that originates in West Africa, but it's happening right here in the UK. Experts are now telling this programme that authorities are in denial and that PE teachers need to be trained to spot the signs in young girls at school. Our reporter Amber Hack has met women in Middlesbrough, Birmingham and London, all speaking for the first time about their experience of being breast ironed by members of their own family. It's a community sensitive hidden crime. The numbers are far greater than we anticipate. A secretive practice happening to girls as young as nine here in Britain. You are not supposed to have breasts at this age. Men will start coming to you to have sex with you. So we are going to iron them. I said iron them. Difficult to detect, but devastating to the lives of the young girls affected. It's mothers, grandmothers that are the perpetrators. If she can iron them and I'm flat, I'll be ugly and nobody will admire me. You can no longer sit back and say I'm fearful of being labelled racist. But PE, you can't hide yourself because someone decided to mutilate my body. We can educate young girls that this is not normal, it's abuse. Breast ironing, sometimes known as pounding, flattening or sweeping, is a hidden form of abuse. The practice originates in Cameroon and other countries in West Africa. It involves ironing a girl's chest with hot objects to delay their breasts from growing so she doesn't attract male attention. And whilst many authorities are now familiar with the cultural practice of female genital mutilation, or FGM, where families cut their daughter's genitals, most have never heard of breast ironing. Organisations say they have anecdotal evidence of it happening to dozens of girls every year here in the UK. We've come to Middlesbrough to meet Kanaya, that's not her real name. Her family are Cameroonian and she was breast ironed at 10 years old. Your mum would say, oh no, you see you're growing up, your breasts are beginning to shoot. It would be a shame if I don't iron them and the men will start coming to you to have sex with you. I still live the pain. Time does not erase that kind of pain. You are not even allowed to cry out. It's like you have brought shame to your family, you are not strong enough. What we need to understand in terms of breast dining is it's a community sensitive hidden crime. Women are not going to speak openly, they're not going to seek help. It's not out there on our government's agenda. I know this is happening because people have divulged it to me and they've said it's the first time openly that they've ever spoken about uh, what's happened to them and they felt ashamed, you know, they felt ashamed that it's part of their body um, that they should feel proud of. It's not well known. With breast dining, it's covert, it's hidden, this is done behind closed doors um, in secrecy. It's mothers, grandmothers that are the perpetrators and um, what I hear from women is this is part of um, a girl becoming a woman. This is a practice carried out by women on women and the pressure on some mothers to carry on the cultural tradition in the UK can be immense. I have four daughters and I remember when I had uh, my daughter turn 10, I remember my, me mom, my late mom proposing to me that, oh, She's growing and I see she's beginning to have little breasts this time we... I said, no, 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 no. Got to a point where we're in our house, we lock the door so that no one should know we are there. If they would have been able to get them, what would they have done to them? They would have ironed their breasts and performed the FGM on them, yeah. So I said, no, over my dead body would that happen. So what do you think? that would have been like if they were actually able to do that to you and to your body? I don't think I'll ever forget, like, I'll be scarred for life. My best friend in year six, she went through it. She was a really nice person to be, she was very happy. 
and once she started going through it she was sad all the time she always wanted to be by herself i didn't know what was going on and it's later that i discovered that her mother was doing that to her there's no official figures to estimate how often this is happening here in the UK, as we aren't collecting any data, but the UN estimates worldwide that there are around 4 million teenage girls at risk of having their breasts ironed. And we've discovered the practice isn't just about making women less attractive to men, it goes to the heart of a woman's sexuality and how to control it. Simone, whose identity we're protecting, was breast ironed at 13 after her mum found out that she was gay. I didn't know how to tell my mom. I was 13, 14 at that time. You dare not mention the word you are a lesbian or you are attracted to a girl. It's a taboo. It's a disgrace. It's an outlaw. So when she found out, what was her reaction? It was terrible. She was mad. This is disgraceful, this is shame. So when she discovered that, she had now to do what we call breast ironing. According to her, the breast weight, maybe I was attracted because of the, those breasts. So when she, if she can iron them and I'm flat, I'll be ugly and nobody will admire me. It, it really, really hurt. And when you're going out, you have this stripe, they take and tie on your breast. At times, you find difficulties in breathing. They really tie. It went on for months. So at that time, I thought maybe I'll never have breast again. Simone was 19 when she had a baby to the man she was forced to marry. And the long-term damage of her breast ironing became apparent. When it comes to breastfeeding, after the breast ironing, it wasn't really easy. The milk would not flow normally. You have some pains. It's so strenuous. It's even hardened, like there's a knot inside. The Home Office says breast ironing is child abuse and should be prosecuted under general assault laws. And if teachers have concerns, they have a duty to report a girl at risk of significant harm. But how can a teacher report when breast ironing isn't part of sex education or even a mandatory part of their training? I did a safeguarding lead training say, a year ago and the lady there had a sixth former who'd put her hand up when they were talking about it in the subject and said so she had it done but she didn't know it was, it was abusive, she didn't know it was something wrong. At that time I was, must have been about 14, 15 because I always hide myself. But PE, you can't hide yourself. Oh, the amount of times I used to try and get out of PE. And um, that was when I noticed their breast is different to mine. If my PE teacher had known back then, they would have noticed something. If I had had help then, I would have been able to deal with it growing up. But now that I'm a full grown adult, and I'm not finding out that this is the reasons why I'm going through this because someone decided to mutilate my body. The first thing has to be about education of teachers, um, people working uh, with young women uh, to make sure that they realise that this is a thing and it's happening here in the UK and that they should be uh, talking about it and prepared to listen to understand what's going on and to then uh, you know, to advise the young person what action they need to take. But we know it's still very harmful to children, it'll impact on their development. The PE staff might notice something and we would want to, you know, those staff to feel empowered to know what to look for and also to know the routes to, to make sure that uh, the safeguarding procedures are put in place. There's a real sensitivity amongst staff about how we perceive, how we look at children. And I think there's a fear in staff of them being prosecuted if they notice something irregular going on. So we know about looking out for the signs and indicators of how children... And even with the new legislation coming in, you still culturally have parents who will flatly refuse their children to take part in any kind of PHSE, sexual, they, it, as far as they're concerned. And unfortunately, they're the children sometimes that are most at risk.
I've been fighting here in the UK and internationally for FGM for over 34 years. I don't want to see our African women and girls wait 34 years. We can educate young girls that this is not normal, it's abuse. Amber Hack with that exclusive report. Uh, we've got some messages on Facebook. One viewer tells us they did this to me. They used a wooden spoon to beat me on my breasts for days to stop my breasts from growing too large. Large. I wish they hadn't done this to me. And another tells us this. It was done to me too every night before bed. My breasts were massaged with a hot towel because I developed quite early. It was a painful experience that I would not wish on anyone else. Let's talk to Sharon Raymond, a GP who specialises in safeguarding issues, and Sarian Karim Kamara, who is a survivor of breast ironing and also of FGM and the founder of Keep the Drums, Lose the Knife. Yeah. Thank you both for coming on the programme. Uh, let me ask you, Sarian, first of all, this happened to you when you were younger at your family home in Sierra Leone. Yeah. How old were you? Who was doing it to you and what happened? I was 12 years old when it happens to me. And at this time, I've already been through FGM at age 11. And this was done to me by my aunt. But my mom was there and my grandmother was there. It's simply because my breasts were too big and I was growing breasts more than my older sisters. So they have to like try to like destroy the tissue. What do they do? They use wooden spoon, which we call agbako. So I'm using this word so that salinans would, I would draw attention to salinans who are doing this so they know that that, can, that is breast ironing because mm -hmm. we don't know it as breast ironing. What's that word again? Agbako is a wooden Ag spoon. Yeah, yeah, it's a wooden spoon we used to like cook and dish. So there's a belief in my culture that if you hit that with a man on a man's um, private part, it will destroy his manhood. So they believe that it do the same. Right. If you want to return the breast, you know, if if a girl is going breast too early, they use the word like send it back. Understood. Yes. But they put this spoon into a fire? Fire, so hot, it's hot, until it, the, it's very hot, and that's when they would massage, like hitting the, your tissue, your breast tissue, can and you massage it. It's very painful. Well, can you describe that pain? Well, um, to be honest, I just know that it's very painful, and it goes on for days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, it, 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 when, you know, when you start to get um, to go breast, mm. even if you just bump into something, it's painful. It Imagine hurt. someone hitting that yeah. and massaging it in, with, the, with the intention to destroy what is building up but inside. And are you also burned? No, I wasn't burned. Right, because okay. Because like, you could see that with people who use iron stone. Yeah, so that's right. why you can't see it. It's, it's not visible in my breast. Okay. You know, yeah. Let me bring in Sharon. Um, this is going on in this country, clearly. We've just seen um, Amber's film. What, what awareness do we need in schools to help, and in GP surgeries, to help stop this child abuse? I think it's really important for us to have regard to raising awareness uh, about this very serious form of, uh, of abuse against women and girls. I think a lot of work has been done just to draw some parallels with female genital mutilation that so much work has been done to raise awareness to incorporate FGM in sort of mandatory safeguarding training for professionals and that includes healthcare professionals and that also includes professionals within education mm -hmm. but it also includes not the mandatory side but it also includes um, having regard to education educating pupils, ha right. educating students so that they know that this is wrong. FGM is a specific criminal offence. It has been since the 80s. We've only just had the first conviction That's right, yeah. uh, in the last few weeks. Should this specifically be a criminal offence? I mean, I'll be honest, I am troubled by the fact that we know that this is going on. OK, we don't have that much awareness in this country and further afield. Mm. We know the numbers in Cameroon, maybe something like one in four women who have been victims um, of this type of, of abuse. So I think it is absolutely key uh, to, to actually have a, a law that specifically addresses breast ironing in the same way that yes a, a law came in in 1985 against FGM and that was tightened up in 2003 with the FGM Act okay we've only just had the first conviction but in the time that those laws have been in place obviously it has raised awareness and it has made people very mindful of break you know of not breaking the law because those laws are in place and you can go to jail up to 14 years if you perform FGM.
And do you both agree with the former Education Secretary Nicky Morgan who said that teachers need to have training, PE teachers in particular, training in order to potentially spot the signs of this? As girls are getting changed for Definitely. PE at school? Definitely, because the, I think the PE teachers will be the best, um, you know, um, people in that position to like try to like spot out this because they would be with children you know where they change or probably where they come off their uniform and their mm -hmm. coats and they probably have vest on and you could see I think you there's, know. there's two aspects isn't there within education it's about educating teachers so that they're aware that this abuse goes on and that they can talk about it we've got relationships education coming in uh, next year FGM will be compulsory uh, compulsorily taught uh, within schools and I think breast ironing should also be incorporated into that uh, into lessons okay let me, let me put this to you because it's, it's pertinent Christine emails to say I worked as a health visitor in the West Midlands and we knew about this back in 2011 when I came across my first case it seems that it's still being swept under the carpet because it's culturally sensitive. Mm -hmm. In the case I was involved with, there was no prosecution, but it did result in safeguarding procedures and a case review. Are people too worried, are people in authority too worried to get involved because they might be accused of being racist, culturally insensitive? Again, the same issues with FGM yeah. when you think about it 20, 30 years ago. But for me, at this point, I think we need education for the entire communities and the entire nation. It doesn't matter whether they're from practicing communities or not, mm. because you don't know who would protect a girl from going to breast ironing. It's a bad experience and it is dangerous for their health. And their, you know, some women are not comfortable taking out their clothes in sure. front of other women and just because of those reasons. Finally, Atiflo yeah. says on Twitter, how can your own parents abuse you in this way they don't, it's not abuse in their eyes they believe they're doing the best thing for you to protect you this is why we need to educate the people that do this practice I think it's, it's seen as an yeah. act of love in the same way that FGM is seen Definitely. as an act of love and it's a hidden scar and that's why it's so important to bring the conversation out into the open educate professionals educate children as well to know okay. that it's wrong and Thank again communities that practice it don't know it as abuse they don't know it as breast ironing so like we we know it like it's like trying to protect this girl from you know from the girl not to be too attractive sure. at a very young age okay so yeah. thank you both thank you very much for coming on you're the welcome really Thanks appreciate nice. it no not yes. not at all thank you thank you yeah. Next, the BBC's Moneybox programme on Radio 4 has been told that the 11,605 investors who put money into the investment firm London Capital Finance might now face a two-year wait before getting just a small percentage of their money back. A total of £236 million was invested into the firm by people who mostly thought they were putting their money into safe, fixed-rate ISAs. But the money was actually going into so-called mini-bonds which are high risk investments. The company collapsed in January following an investigation by the Financial Conduct Authority into misleading advertising. And the Serious Fraud Office now says it's arrested four people in connection with this case. Let's talk to Juliana Lancaster, who lost her life savings. That's over a hundred thousand pounds, which was her retirement pot. In Burnley, we've got uh, Amanda Cunningham, who lost thousands in savings too, that she'd set aside for her son. Christine Anderson in Plymouth also lost a substantial amount of money. And Finbar O'Connell, one of the administrators of London Capital Finance, is here. Um, briefly, Finbar O'Connell, what went wrong in a nutshell? People put huge sums of money, often, often their life savings, into what they thought was a protected bond, uh, FCA regulated um, ISA status and it turns out that the people behind it were not intending to invest their money invest their money wisely and to help them to get it back, let alone the interest. Where's the money gone? 25% of it went to a, a company called Surge which, which is the take-on company which um, effectively ushered the bondholders into LCF. LCF then lent the money out. Um, it was supposedly going to a variety of different SME borrowers. It, it went to 12 different entities. So um, those entities all accepted that they would repay the 100% of the money, mm -hmm. so effectively, and the 25%, which had already gone. Mm -hmm. 
that briefly? Well, on, only two of those are independent entities. All the rest of them are linked into a core group of people, and, and those monies are gone. They've passed through those entities, and my job is to try to recover it. Juliana Lancaster, you have lost over £100,000. You have saved your whole life. That yes. was your retirement pot. Yes, that's correct. Tell our audience ha how, how you cope with that. Well, first of all, it was a shock. So he just went into totally shock mode. I tried to ignore it. I didn't do anything. Then um, I waited for a bit. Then I wrote to the MP, Nicky Morgan. Um, I started at the top. Um, and now, sort of two months later, I'm in bereavement. That's the only thing, the only way I can describe the feeling. I'm trying not to think about it. Say, I've written it off. Fine, I get on with life. In fact, I've just, in, the, in a month in between, I've started a new business. I'm hoping to start a new business, hoping we'll take off, just to s provide for my future. Mm. But when someone mentions it, like today, you're asking me how I feel about it, and, and there's some the amount of money, I just feel sick in my stomach. Uh, let me bring in uh, Christine. Christine, you too lost a substantial sum of money. I don't know if it was over £100,000 like Juliana, but how is this affecting you? Well, luckily I didn't put all of my uh, batch of eggs into one basket, so it's not quite as devastating for me as it was for Julia. Um, I was just looking to move my conventional low-yield ISA into an innovative finance ISA. Um, <laughs> I believe, as the, as the uh, FCA were regulating the ad advertising, that, that everything I'd read was true. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, a, it was a, a horrific shock to find out that it wasn't even an ISA. Amanda, what about yourself? Yeah, it's okay. Well, I was, uh, I was trying to save for my, um, my son's future years autism, and um, I'd, I'd basically accumulated uh, debts over uh, my adult life. Um, basically, they weren't doing anything in a deposit account. Um, so I was looking at other savings vehicles to try and put um, that, um, that money. And I found the 8% ISA. Um, and, you know, that basically it went from there. Um, I just wanted to get a little bit more income on that money, um, you know, so that it would work, you know, so that it would grow. Um, that basically, that's what how much, feels, uh, how much do you think you've lost? Do you know? Well, the thing is, is the administrator is saying that we're only going to get um, minimum, uh, sorry, maximum 20% back. It could even be less than that. So to be quite honest, it's, it's m more or less the whole of it, to be quite honest. It's, um, you know, there's not going to be much left. Which, which uh, is how much, Amanda? Um, I mean, for me, that's, um, I, I'm, I'm not willing to say on here, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's basically, it's a life-changing amount that I've lost, that I would lose. Right. Can I just say? Yes, of course. That um, I didn't put all my eggs in one basket either, initially. Um, I was very cautious and I first started with the 5,000 bond mini bond, which I knew was not ISO, it was mini bond. Mm. And I took this risk with it. And the reason I took the risk is because the um, LFC, LCF said that they're putting the money into small businesses and startups. Yeah. And I thought, I had lots of friends who are doing startups and small businesses. And I thought this would be a nice way of helping them as well. So I was doing that and cautiously waiting for the 5,000, see how the company works. I also went to visit them personally in Brighton, spent a couple of hours in their offices to make sure that, that they were genuine. Yeah. Um, but um, it's only the whole reason f is when the ISIS came out, even then, as an ISA matured, then I changed over to LFC. So it's only just a couple of months before this whole thing happened that all my eggs were in one basket. Wow. Well, I'm very sorry it to hear that. It wasn't all yeah. initially. Yeah. Thank you, all of you, for coming on the programme, and uh, we'll see what happens. But thank you. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Could I say one thing? Before really before briefly, Finbar, yes, if you wouldn't just, mind. Just that amongst um, the assets which I'm which I've got possession of, there are a couple of real assets. So I don't want people to think that everything they invested in was not real. There are a couple of real genuine assets which, which will uh, produce some funds to go back to the bondholders. Okay. Thank you. All of you. Thank you.
If you're getting in touch, you're very welcome. Use the hashtag Victoria Live. You can send us an email, victoria at bbc.co.uk. Next on the programme, some more England players endured racist abuse while playing for their country. On the pitch last night, England beat Montenegro 5-1 in that second Euro 2020 qualifying campaign game. Monkey chants, though, were directed at Danny Rose. England manager Gareth Southgate has called for football's governing body, UEFA, to investigate. I didn't hear during the early part of the game, but I'm told there was things in the early part of the game as well. But I certainly heard when Danny Rose was booked, um, and it's unacceptable. We will report it, but I think that reporting is already um, in place because so many people in other areas of the ground have heard it. I believe the UEFA delegate also heard it. Raheem Sterling scored England's fifth goal in the 81st minute and celebrated by putting his hands to his ears. He shared the photo on social media after the game. Best way to silence the haters and yeah, I mean racists. After the game, he spoke to Five Live. It's a shame really because it was a, a massive team performance on a difficult ground, a difficult place to come. We knew how difficult it would be. Uh, we knew it would be you know, hard at times and we stuck together as a team and, and there was some great performance in there today. But then, you know, just a couple of idiots, I'm sorry my, by my language, but a couple of idiots ruined a, a, a great night. Um, and it's it's a, a real sad thing to, to hear and, and for, I didn't hear it personally, but my, you know, my teammate Danny heard it. So it's a, it's a sad thing to hear. Former Tottenham and Stoke player Garth Crooks is a board member of the anti-discrimination charity Kick It Out, challenges racism and all forms of discrimination in football. Also with us, former England and Liverpool player John Barnes. Uh, Garth Crooks, first of all, how do you think the players dealt with it? I thought they dealt with it very well. Um, I'd like to have seen it go a stage first.